So good morning or good afternoon or good afternoon I guess for most of you although I see some people on the on the on the left coast of the United States uh, so it's obviously morning here maybe we'll give it another moment or so where you know the participants are rolling in uh, it's 702 we want to make sure we have enough time for uh, excellent uh, presentation from uh, Dr. Norgard and then the case discussion from Dr. Pontone uh, which uh, I think will uh, also be uh, not only informative, but uh, highly engaging, as uh, John Luca always is. For those of you who are on the line who don't know uh, Bjarne, uh, Bjarne is uh, not only a good friend and a tremendous collaborator of mine, he's been a thought leader uh, in uh, CT integration and structural heart disease, having just published one of the seminal works uh, a few months ago in Jack, looking at post-implant leaflet thickening and clinical outcomes published extensively previously in, in CT for TAVI. Uh, but uh, the reason he's speaking today, of course, is uh, because he is a pioneer of uh, not only the validation and a trialist in, uh, in FFRCT, having been the principal investigator of the um, NXT trial published in January 2014 in uh, JAK. It's hard to believe it's uh, three years ago but also um, as one of the first, uh, well, really the first clinical adopter, uh, and not just clinical adopter from an early experience perspective, but wholesale programmatic integration of FFRCT as a supplementary and uh, additive tool for patients with stable uh, chest pain, um, and very much now uh, looked at uh, the clinical outcomes of such patients and has published extensively uh, as a uh, as we've seen recently in Jack Imaging and, and journals of the like. So we thought it would be a, a good opportunity for uh, Dr. Norgard to educate us all based on his experience about the importance of image quality, uh, appropriate uh, CT scan protocols, and in particular, the use of uh, beta blockade and nitroglycerin to optimize um, diagnostic performance and clinical utility of FFRCT. So thank you again, uh, Bjarne, for obliging us this ask and uh, look forward to your talk. We're going to have Dr. Norgard speak, and then we'll open it to the floor for uh, questions, and then we'll follow with clinical cases from Dr. Punt. So we'll give it another moment. We may have to rejig the schedule and send you off first, Gianluca. Okay, Gianluca, why don't we kick it off with a clinical case? Thank you for your flexibility. Perfect. Thank you so much. I want just to start with... Uh, uh, this uh, brief uh, um, uh, presentation about our clinical experience in Monzino in Milan about the use of the, of the FFR uh, CT in a real clinical world and clinical practice. I want just to show you two cases uh, that are extremely useful uh, uh, to improve our experience in the real world. And the first one is uh, a typical case in which, thanks to the use of FFRCT, we can avoid further non-invasive stress tests as gatekeeper to invasive cornea and geography. I want just to uh, show you some information about the clinical history of the patient. This is a typical patient uh, usually referred to CAT, to cardiac CT, sorry. Uh, a 61 years old man with multiple cardiovascular risk factors, but this patient has no diabetes, that was seen, who was symptomatic for a typical uh, chest pain. If we apply the Diamond and Foster criteria, which we cross the symptoms, characteristics, age, and gender of the patient, the pretest likelihood of coronary artery disease of this patient is 59%. This means that this is a typical intermediate to higher risk patient. If we look just the uh, guidelines of the European Society of, of Cardiology, uh, they, suggest, <clears throat> they suggest usually the use of cardiac CT in the low to intermediate risk. Uh, and they usually it suggests the use of a stress test in a patient with the intermediate to high risk patient. So this is uh, not the perfect setting in which we can use CADEX CT in a clinical practice. Uh, in any case, we have scanned this patient with the CT. Just a couple of information about the scan parameters of this exam. Uh, the body mass index of the patient was uh, uh, was low, 22. And so for this reason, we have used the low tube voltage uh, um, during our scan, 100 kVp. The heart rate of the patient was not uh, stable and a bit high. So for this reason, we have used the multi-phase uh, acquisition window uh, ranging between 40% up to 80% of the cardiac cycle. 
but uh, uh, during the scan phase, the heart rate was stable, and so the best image quality was reached in a diastolic phase, 75% of the cardiac cycle. Have note that despite the multi-phase acquisition, we reach a very, we have we reached a very low um, effective radiation dose, 2.1 millisievert in this patient. What we found in terms of cardiac CT, okay, this is the uh, uh, multiplanar reconstruction of the left anterior descending artery, in which we found multiple plaques uh, in the proximal and middle segment of the left anterior descending artery. Here and here, and in this site, we found a calcification. On the contrary, here we have a narrowing of the lumen due to the presence of a fibrolipidic plaque. If we perform a quantification of the degree of stenosis, in this point, the range of uh, stenosis uh, is between 50 to 7% in agreement with the SCCT score provided to report this kind of exams. Just a couple of comments about this area and uh, this lesion. Uh, there is a, a huge calcification here, so we cannot be sure about what happened uh, at this level because we can have obstructive or non-obstructive coronary artery disease when you have a severe calcification, like in this case, from anatomical point of view, is a bit challenging. If we move to left circumflex artery, the vessel is uh, uh, show a good patency, but here we have just a focal binary calcification in the middle segment of the left circumflex artery. If we enlarge our images, uh, you can see here that, uh, again, a bit complicated to provide a precise uh, estimation of the degree of stenosis due to the presence of a blooming effect related uh, to the presence of two or calcified lesion. So in this case, we can say obstructive coronary artery disease, but we cannot be sure. If we move to right coronary artery, we are more lucky here because there is just a couple, there are a couple of calcification. We are quite consistent that there is no significant coronary artery stenosis in this patient. So for us, there is no significant disease from anatomical point of view on this vessel. Okay, so now we have a moderate, uh, more moderate stenosis of the LAD. Uh, we have an undeterminated coronary artery disease on left circumflex artery and no obstructive coronary artery disease on right coronary. Cor right coronary. Uh, in the reclinical ward, when we have this kind of a patient symptomatic for chest pain, we have two different scenarios. A more aggressive scenario that means to refer the patient based on this on this CT findings to CAT uh, to perform eventually an invasive FFR in case that lesion on LED is confirmed, or we can refer it to a patient to a stress test as gatekeeper to CAT. In this case, usually a second level stress test is highly suggested based on the local expertise. So uh, uh, a stress echo can be suggested or as alternative, SPECT or stress MR. But uh, in this specific case, as you can imagine, we have the FFRCT in the same data set. Now we can analyze the value for each vessel. This is left main artery and left anterior descending artery. In this region where we have found the anatomical disease is followed by a, a reduction, a significant reduction of the FFRCT because uh, we observed already in this area a value of 0 0.71 and the lowest value was reached at the apical segment of LED that was 0 0.66. If we move to the left circumflex artery, do not forget that we have the, a binary calcified lesion on uh, um, left circumflex artery uh, that was very difficult to estimate in terms of degree of stenosis. But in this case, the FFRCT help us to take a decision on that vessel because there is no pathologic fractional flow reserve. It started with a value in the proximal segment of 0 0.95 and the lowest value was uh, reached at the apical uh, segment, more distal segment, but it was a normal 0 0.87. No doubt about the right coronary artery because uh, it was normal from anatomical point of view and it was normal from functional point of view as well, because again, uh, we have a 0 0.96 in the proximal segment of right coronary artery and the value is still normal also in the more distal point of the right coronary artery. Okay.
Uh, based on this evidence, we have a lesion, obstructive uh, uh, coronary artery lesion associated with an uh, FFRCT. Uh, this is enough uh, from our perspective to decide to refer the patient in this specific case to CAT to confirm this lesion and eventually to be treated. For research aim, in this case, uh, in this patient, we have also perfusion study uh, with CT, and this is very useful just to reasoning, to, re to, re to discuss about the uh, comparison between FFRCT and CTP. This is the perfusion at rest that was completely normal, and this is the perfusion at stress that was positive in the septum and in the anterior wall, as you can see, but it was positive in the lateral wall as well, as well, a huge perfusion defect in the lateral wall. So it seems that there is a disagreement between perfusion study and um, FFRCT analysis. Uh, the patient was referred to CAT. This is uh, the invasive coronary angiography of the, of the left uh, uh, coronary artery. As you can see, find the lesion on left circumflex artery and the lesion here on the left anterior descending artery, exactly in the same point that was detected by cardiac computer tomography. But when we made, this is uh, the right coronary artery on the other side that is uh, absolutely normal. We performed the FFR, invasive FFR for research aim in this case in all vessels. And what we found, we found that the only pathologic value of FFR was reached in the left anterior descending artery and the lowest value found was 0.67. So uh, if we want just to summarize by using the CADS RADS classification provided by the Society of Cardiovascular Computer Tomography, based on anatomical uh, evaluation, I mean CT, we have uh, the highest level of the disease is an intermediate stenosis of LAD. In this case, usually a functional assessment is highly suggested. But we have already a functional assessment in the same data set that is FFRCT that was pathologic. And this suggests to refer the patient to CAT with potential uh, indication for PCI on uh, PC revascularization on LAD. In this case, stress CTP is a little bit in disagreement because it confirms what we have found on LAD territory, but there is a positive perfusion defect in the lateral wall of the left vein. But when we refer the patient to CAT, uh, the CAT showed from anatomical point of view one vessel disease. And when we apply invasive FFR, the invasive FFR confirmed one vessel disease as showed by the integration of the information by CT and uh, FFR CT. So the final message of this uh, case is that uh, FFRCT is a very useful uh, tool to detect the relevance of a coronary artery disease, but as compared to other approach, for example, stress CTP, provide a per lesion evaluation rather than a per territory evaluation. And this is a potential typical case of a false positive perfusion defect with the CT in the lateral wall that, as you, can, as you know, is uh, suffer for beam hardening artifact, and that is the typical location in which we can have uh, uh, fast positive cases. Maybe we could just open it uh, quickly to questions. I mean, that's a fascinating case, okay. Gianluca. Uh, okay. I think okay. It, it highlights one of the advantages of um, really of pinpointing uh, ischemia, obviously, with FFRCT. Even we talk about a one-stop shop with CTP and, and anatomy, but uh, it can be obviously a very powerful test, but it's still obviously limited uh, by a whole different set of uh, image artifacts, as well as uh, the fact that ultimately it's, it's hard to discriminate where the, where the increased resistance to flow is actually going, right? Uh, uh, whereas FFRCT, what we found, and maybe you can comment, is that you can not only uh, get, a, get a calculation of pressure uh, proximal and distal to the stenosis, but then in the distal vessel as well to understand the overall pressure loss across the entire territory. I don't know. Yes, if I can just add one comment on that, as you know, we are doing a lot of experience in both of the field and behind the uh, undoubtable advantage of the FFRCT uh, that does not require a second scan, a second contest injection, uh, contest agent injection, and no use of stressor that uh, is uh, sometimes a bit complicated. Behind this aspect that is a technical and practical aspect, uh, the difference uh, regarding to a technique that provides the per lesion information is compared a technique that provides per territory information is crucial in the planning of uh, um, 
revascularization strategy because as you can see especially in patients with multiple vessel disease sometimes the perfusion defect is a little bit uh, is a non not really useful because the uh, does not give us the information that we need to decide what we have uh, uh, treat so this is the real uh, crucial point the crucial difference between these two different approach are there any other comments i see people who do perfusion both uh, dr neiman and i see the musc group um, anything further to add about how you implement these two te two complementary but different technologies or no it is it is interesting to uh, to see the uh, the comparative results uh, yeah we, we um, this is Kuniman. Um, so we tried this as well. Uh, we, in, in our study, we tried two different techniques. We compared the uh, the Siemens uh, FFR with a, a dynamic perfusion. So both of them are a little bit slightly different. And in this case, we found uh, uh, comparable accuracy, but also complementary. So there are some cases where the uh, the FFR didn't work so well, uh, but then we also had cases where it worked really well and actually. Uh, correlated better with invasive FFR than the perfusion imaging uh, did. So yeah, so those cases we do see. Uh, apparently, it's not exactly the same. Interesting. So that's a great, great uh, start of the uh, the session, Dr. Norgard. Please. Thank you. These are my disclosures from my short talk here. Uh, basically, what is the goal, overall goal for coronary CT uh, and geography acquisition? That is to provide images with a clear high contrast view of all coronary arteries and plaque free from artifacts affecting visibility of the lumen boundary using the lowest possible radiation dose. But then what's the goal of CT for subsequent FFRCT assessment? Well, it's very important to highlight from the beginning that the goal CT-wise for FFRCT assessment is exactly the same for us co coronary CT and geography per se. Based on the recent technological advancements in CT acquisition techniques and the growing body of evidence of, in the optimal performance of coronary CT and geography, the Society uh, of Cardiovascular Computer Tomography recently came up with an update on the 2009 best practice coronary CT and geography guidelines. In this short presentation, I'll discuss issues related to patient selection, patient preparation, CT acquisition, post-processing, with special focus on patient preparation, especially the importance of rigorous use of beta blockers and nitroglycerin in all patients taking into account my own experience. Although it may seem trivial to many, the importance of proper patient selection for image quality is often forgotten. It should be acknowledged that coronary CT and geography assessment cannot be performed in all patients and that CT visualization of the coronaries being small structures moving up to 5 centimeters per heartbeat is challenging. In fact, the most challenging discipline in the field of cardiac CT. It should also be acknowledged that patient-specific factors in weight, the presence and severity of coronary calcification, heart rate, and heart rate variability and cooperation are important factors in order to obtain a good and diagnostic outcome. In my department in general, I say that we can deal with one artifact issue, but not two. Thus, for example, if the patient has severe calcification, the heart rate should be perfect and the weight optimal. Combining a high and irregular heart rate and severe calcification most often will compromise significantly the, the diagnostic value of the test. Of course, uh, as important is uh, patient preparation, uh, continue all regular me medications uh, except for phosphodiesterase inhibitors and long-lasting nitrates. I'll come back to that in a moment. Uh, do not use caffeine products. Uh, in my department, we say do not use such products uh, within uh, 12 uh, hours up to the scan. Well, what about, what about smoking? Uh, it is well documented that smoking reduces the diameter of the coronaries and that smoking attenuates the vasodilatatory response to nitroglycerin. In our department, patients are not allowed to smoke two hours before coronary CT uh, and geography. You, uh, I will not go into details about education, coaching, and preparing the patients, of course, are essential still in coronary CT and geography. 
uh, efforts on minimizing patient's anxiety should be taken. Practice breath hold. Ensure breath hold time will be sufficient for scan time. Evaluate impact on breath holds on heart rate. A good ECG signal and sufficient IV cannulation should be secured. I'll spend some time on the importance of good heart rate control and image quality and in order to reduce the uh, uh, radiation dose. In this study from the Achenbach group, they showed that even when using the CT dual source scanner having the highest temporal resolution of all scanners, heart rate significantly influenced on image quality. Perfect image quality without any motion artifact, as indicated with a score of zero, was most frequent in patients with a heart rate less than 60 beats per minute, as can be seen here, and very rare in patients with a heart rate above uh, 80. This finding was independent on which vessel territory being explored, as shown here. In another study by the same group, they found even by experts, expert reads, that the proportion of at least one unevaluable segment increased with increasing heart rate. In patients with a heart rate less than 60, only 3% of the patients had at least one unevaluable segment. And look here, even though that we just raised the heart rate to between 61 and 65, uh, as many as 21% of the patients had at least one unevaluable uh, segment. Accordingly, the updated SCCD guidelines on best practice and coronary CT angiography recommended that the target acquisition heart rate should be set at 60 beats uh, per minute. Of course, CT uh, angiography can be performed at higher heart rates, but at a price not only on image quality, also, uh, also on uh, a price of a higher radiation dose because of uh, less uh, uh, probabilities of using prospective scan. And this, irrespective of what the vendor or representatives might say, uh, uh, as late as yesterday, we had a vendor representative here, and he told my staff that with this and this uh, new feature, heart rate is of no influence on image quality. I had to tell him that this is totally undocumented and emotional not according to my or my staff experience, not according to the literature, and basically not true. This should be acknowledged. Uh, a few words on how we practice heart rate control in my department. We do around 2,500 CTs for coronary assessment per year. Before doing CT, the referring physician has provided us with information related to beta block or contraindications asthmatic disease, AV block, intraventricular block, left ventricular function. Our pretreatment regime is that based on an ECG that we have access to on beforehand, uh, we send to the patients a tenor of 100 milligrams in the event of a heart rate more than 60 beats per minute. If it's a small patient, we only send out 50 milligrams. We tell the patients to take the medications approximately three hours before the scan. In the event of contraindications uh, to beta blockade, we uh, send out evaporidine and tell the patient to take it uh, 15 milligram one hour before the scan. About 30% of our patients that receive oral beta blockade need additional IV beta blocker at the time of the study in order to obtain the target heart rate. We use metoprolol, 5 milligram boluses, and we, uh, our top doses is 20 milligram. Rarely we use uh, IV esmolol, uh, which has a rapid onset of very short duration time, especially in patients with heart failure. Following this regime in our institution, a target heart rate uh, can be obtained in 85% of the patients. Beta blockers administered, uh, we administer in 80% of the patients and evaporating in 5% of the patients. Severe side effects to beta blockers uh, are advanced AV block, bradycardia, bronchospasmon, and worsening heart failure. However, by pre screening of patients, such incidents should be avoided or at least be extremely rare. In my own experience, uh, taking into account 8,000 CT scans in which we administered IV beta blockers, only uh, five patients were categorized as having uh, uh, severe side effects. 
one's asthma, and, two, and three with advanced uh, uh, AV block. None of these were fatal. In summary, benefits of beta blockers are that they minimize coronary motion, minimize misregistration artifacts, and decrease radiation dose by allowing increased use of, use of prospective gating. I'll spend a little time on the use of nitroglycerin. Um, for some reason that I frankly do not understand, still many sensors do not use nitroglycerin as routine before coronary CT angiography. In Denmark, 15% of sensors do not use nitroglycerin routinely. First of all, FFRCT cannot be assessed reliably without the use of nitroglycerin, since this is one of the premises for the FFRCT computational model. Also, nitroglycerin has a significant influence of, on vessel interpretability that I will come back to in a moment, and it may attenuate the potential coronary vasoconstriction induced by beta blockers. In this rather small but quite elegant study by De Kramer and colleagues, patients were randomized to no or to sublingual nitroglycerin before 64 multislide CT angiography. Patients were matched on age, sex, BMI, and calcium score. The effects on coronary lumen diameter and volume using a dedicated software in LAD and RCA, a number of visualized septal branches were assessed as shown here. As can be seen, the use of nitroglycerin resulted in a significantly higher diameter in both RCA and LAD, higher volume, and also uh, higher recruitment of more, of more small, small side effects. Of note in this study, there were no difference between groups regarding side effects and blood pressure and heart rate. The effect of sublingual nitroglycerin before CT on CT diagnostic performance has been tested in several studies. The findings are consistent across all studies with nitroglycerin being safe and resulting in increasing diagnostic performance, uh, as in this study by you and colleagues, where nitroglycerin spray 1.4 4 milligram one minute before CT resulted in increased diagnostic sensitivity, specificity, predictive values in both proximal, middle, and distal segments. Okay, and oh, also this study, I forgot this study. This is a very important study by Tax and, and colleagues. It's a meta analysis including all the diagnostic performance assessing the influence of, of uh, nitroglycerin of uh, CT diagnostic performance. I will not go into detail, but highlight their conclusions, stating that uh, sublingual nitroglycerin administration results in significant coronary artery dilatation. Nitroglycerin increases the number of evaluable coronary branches. Image quality is improved the most in smaller coronary branches. Nitroglycerin increases the diagnostic accuracy of coronary CT angiography. Most side effects are mild and do not require medical uh, intervention. Okay, sublingual nitroglycerin is necessary. Should we administer tablets or spray? In my department today, we use spray only. With tablets, we often experience that they were not fully dissolved after the scan and thus apparently wasn't of much benefit. In this elegant study performed in the cath lab, patients were randomized to either capsule or spray 0.8 milligram uh, nitroglycerin using intracoronary 0.2 uh, milligram nitroglycerin as the reference standard. The effect measure was changed in proximal vessel diameter. Patient who received nitroglycerin capsule, as shown here, uh, as the first application, had no significant change in vessel diameter when compared to the baseline. In contrast, patients who received spray nitroglycerin as a, had a significant increase in vessel diameter, as shown here, uh, close to the maximum response as assessed after intercoronary nitroglycerin. Of note, there were no significant changes in various hemodynamic parameters between groups. When should nitroglycerin be administered? Based on the hemodynamic response as assessed by the systolic and the heart rate, blood pressure and heart rate, it has been suggested that nitroglycerin is best administered after three minutes. However, these findings are, to the best of my knowledge, based on the use of tablets. In my practical experience and also according to the literature after spray, patients report headaches typically already after one minute. Thus, in our department, using spray only, the recommendation is to do the CT after one 
one to uh, three minutes. In my experience, the uh, often discussed reflex tachycardia potentially induced by an collision is of no practical importance. However, this may be due to the fact that most patients in this department are pre-treated with beta blockers. Thus, as highlighted in the SCCT guidelines, the use of nitroglycerin should always be used before coronary CT angiography. In my point of view, a coronary CT angiography without the use of nitroglycerin is not a real coronary CT uh, angiography. In my department, all patients receive pre-scan nitroglycerin 0.8 milligrams uh, before the scan, if for some reason uh, more than three minutes occur uh, up to the scan, we give additional spray 0.4 milligram. Top lingual nitroglycerin is safe. And most often, the side effects such as headache are, are transient. In my department, uh, the only absolute contraindication to nitroglycerin is the use of phosphor, uh, phosphodiesterase inhibitors such as sildenafil for the treatment of uh, erectile dysfunction or pulmonary hypertension or long-lasting uh, nitrates. If the patient in my department do not for some reason want nitroglycerin, we don't do the scan and refer the patient instead to some other kind of testing. In my department, only a about one third of the patients report uh, that they have side effects. We spend some time on information before the scan about nitroglycerin side effects, uh, uh, so they are prepared for this uh, maybe slight dizziness and, and headache. We tell them that it's a good thing to have a headache because uh, it, it tells us that the, the medication actually works and that we will get the best diagnostic uh, result. In summary, use nitroglycerin during CT acquisition, preferably uh, one to three minutes uh, prior to image acquisition. Inform patients about side effects, especially headache, so they are prepared. Use two sprays, 0.8 milligram. Use a beta blocker may avoid reflex tachycardia. Ask patients not to take any nitrates 12 to 14 hours prior to CT acquisition. Do not smoke right before the CT scan. With regard to coronary CT angiography acquisition, following our rigorous regime on selecting the right patients, use of heart rate control and nitroglycerin in all patients in this department, prospective uh, uh, ECG gated acquisition is performed in more than 95% of the patients, resulting in a mean radiation dose, including the CalScore assessment of 2.4 uh, millisievert. With rigorous selection of patients and planning of the scanning, retro, uh, the, the scanning retrospective scanning uh, being associated with a high radiation dose can be in, avoided in most patients. Again, What's good for coronary CT angiography is good for FFRCT. A few words on post-processing techniques in relation to FFRCT. Today, with the new platform for FFRCT assessment, it can be performed with both diastole and systole phases. We typically upload a couple of phases, so Hotflow has something to work with. With regard to iteration, iterate iterative reconstructions. This is okay as long as the lumen and plaques can be visualized. As for CT, FFRCT involves precise measurements made on vessels. As for CT, artifacts may impact FFRCT. FFRCT is based on a detailed 3D model of the coronary tree and the myocardium. Smaller vessels are important. With regard to field of view, it is important to include the, the total myocardial mass, so, so be aware uh, not to uh, uh, to include also the inferior wall that we sometimes uh, tend to forget. In the event of a high calcific burden, use as little feel of you as possible. Shortly on uh, uh, FFRCT artifacts, uh, these are from these data from the next trial. The top three artifacts leading to um, uh, image quality being inadequate for FFRCT analysis were. Misregistration, blooming, uh, 
and noise. Again, avoid artifacts by proper selection of patients. Beta blockers also take into account uh, that you may be able to optimize MA and KV, and uh, there may also be issues on contrast. There are no time to go into detail on that. Today in our center, we have used FFRCT in our routine practice for almost uh, three years now. Um, we have recently for this center published our first uh, real world data showing feasibility of this uh, method. It is often stated uh, that FFRCT assessment is not possible in a large proportion of patients. We can show by sticking to the guidelines, SSCTD guidelines of best CT practice, uh, especially regarding rigorous heart rate control and the use of nitroglycerin in all patients, that we receive a conclusive re uh, FFRCT result in more than 90% of the patients, which is in fact a higher proportion of conclusive conclusive results when we compare to the time when we use nuclear testing, at least in this department. Well, I have to stop now. Uh, these are my final comments. FFRCT is derived from precise modeling of the coronary tree, just not just areas of disease. Uh, coronary CT angiography best practice equal best practice for FFRCT. Scan optimization is essential in unlocking the potential uh, not only for FFRCT, also for coronary CT angiography. Best practice coronary CT angiography is uh, achieved by incorporating practice from the 2009 and 2016 SCCD guidelines on how to perform CT angiography. Usually small incremental protocol variations are all that is required uh, in order to improve significantly uh, your CT quality. Basal dilatation with sublingual nitrous is essential both for CT and for FFRCT assessment. And the, it is important that uh, the physicians and uh, uh, staff doing coronary CT are comfortable with the use of beta bloggers, both orally and intravenous. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Bjorn, and that was a great overview, uh, really highlighting uh, the importance of uh, best practice for cardiac CT, which is clearly best practice for FFRCT. Appreciate you taking the time. I open it to the floor uh, for any questions or comments. Are most sites using uh, um, a metered spray for uh, administration of, of nitroglycerin, and if so, are they using one or two puffs? or? Yeah, this is Kun. Uh, yeah, we usually use two puffs. Uh, often find that the first puff is uh, only half a puff. So uh, I use two, maybe three puffs every now and then. We did run into some problems where we had one patient, I think, probably with somebody with aortic uh, stenosis and uh, didn't do so well. So then for a while, the, 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 the technicians couldn't deliver it anymore and had to be a doctor. I don't know whether other sites have that problem, whether technicians are allowed to give the spray or it has to be a physician. It's something that we ran into. This is an important point. We're actually going through what we call a transfer of function where um, where technologists will be able to do this uh, because historically we've had actually patients administering and if they're naive to using it, they don't deliver it very well. So it's a good point. Well, well in, yeah, in yes, uh, my department, CT is performed by, by the, the cardiology staff. So the staff are they have a, a long tradition giving these drugs, both, both intravenous beta blockers and nitroglycerin. So, so here in Aarhus, all uh, preparation of the patients are performed by dedicated nurses. Uh, no doctors are involved in this. If, if uh, this is Gianluca, if I can add just one comment, we use nitroglycerin uh, um, as well uh, two, two, two before the acquisition, but. Uh, very important enough that the administration of nitratus is is accurate, is well done, because otherwise the effect of the nitratus is not maximal. For example, in our experience in which we have in the same patient, uh, the acquisition with the nitratus, uh, I mean the rest of the CT data set, and then the acquisition under adenosine effect, the, some 
sometimes the effect in terms of vasodilatation is absolutely different between these two uh, settings. And in a lot of cases, because uh, the uh, approach of the nurse or it's not uh, so perfect in terms of uh, administration of nitrates. So it's very important to be sure that the, the drug is in the mouth and uh, it uh, reach the uh, uh, target area. Yes, I, I couldn't agree more. And, and I don't know who should address this, but I think for people on the phone, I, uh, I think you drove home the point so well, Bjarne, about the value of nitroglycerin, not only for coronary stenosis evaluation, which I think is really established, but um, also how important it is for not just modeling of FFRCT, but the reality is best practice uh, invasive FFR relies on it. So to simulate similar conditions as to the invasively uh, measured FFR, it's really essential that um, nitroglycerin is administered. And, and uh, you made a comment which really resonated with me. You said if, if the patient is unwilling or cannot take nitroglycerin, you refer them to another test. You simply don't proceed because you know it. the yield is going to be uh, sig significantly reduced, which is, I think, a really important message. Hi, it's Lynn from Duke. Can I ask a question? Of course. So, um, I completely agree with everything that was said, and I just I have a question for those on the call. We've sort of run into times sometimes where we have to make a choice about beta blockers versus nitro when patients are coming in with a relatively low blood pressure or having to change how much beta blockers so we can make sure we can give nitro. And I just want to know, are others facing this situation and how do they handle it? Well, my experience is that in patient, well, it depends on the cause of the low blood pressure. But uh, in fact, if you give uh, two pops of nitroglycerin in the patient with a blood pressure, in a stable patient with no uh, acute uh, coronary event, uh, blood pressure, or systole or, or on 100, for instance, it, it 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 doesn't really affect the blood pressure in these patients. Uh, that's my experience. So as long as the patient is uh, stable, we I, I I'm not worried about the, the blood pressure. Uh, and, and the same goes for, for IV beta blockade against the uh, patient. Uh, this is cool. Un unless the patient is decompensated, then probably evabradine doesn't have as much effect on blood pressure either. So that could be an option as well. Uh, but you have to ask why the patient is tachycardic and has heart failure and low blood pressure. So I guess you would have to be a little bit careful about that and wonder whether it's the right time for the test. Yeah, you, I think you hit the nail on the head. We had a case recently that a uh, patient had new onset uh, uh, atrial fibrillation and heart failure, and of course they send us uh, for coronary CT, and as you mentioned, the patient's actively being diuresed, has been into the eMERGE four times already, and is on deltiazem for reasons that are unclear, right? And we'll never be able to rate control the person properly, and, and obviously we couldn't give much beta blocker, and it, inevitably things don't go as well as you would like. So, there's, you know, I, I think... Bjarne, another comment you made, which was really important, is that uh, it's not the test for everyone, right? I mean, you have to do it well. There's, an, We have in cardiology and cardiovascular medicine other testing, so you have to do the right test for the for the patient at the right time. So, And if you're going to do it, do it, also, do it I, properly, I though. This is Bjarne again, sorry. But, but, but in, in my department, we don't do CT in patients in whom that we don't have an updated uh, ejection fraction, left ventricular ejection fraction, we have an ECG. So we have the patient evaluated in our outpatient clinic within the last two weeks before the CT scan. If you don't have information on the left ventricular ejection fraction, of course, uh, there, are, there, there may be problems both with, with regards to nitroglycerin, especially with regards to uh, to uh, the use of beta blockers. I've seen centers where they didn't even have an ECG before they gave beta blockers, and, and this is not acceptable in my point of view. Yeah. Okay. Well, this happens sometimes in other places, of course, where, uh, uh, I mean, sometimes we know the patients, but I mean, what you have, Bjarne, is a, is a luxury that you know the patient before you can send the medication. Yeah. Unfortunately, we did not always have that luxury, <laughs> to be honest. Yeah. No, you, you're welcome here, Cone. <laughs> you know. 
<laughs> so I know um, <laughs> I know Gianluca uh, you had another yeah. case I think we're pushing up against the, the clock just because uh, you know I think your your case but coming back to it uh, uh, maybe I could just ask you one question um, how do you determine who you're going to use CT perfusion oh, this is for you for Daniele uh, CT perfusion versus FFR CT um, and do you make that decision before you see the baseline anatomy, or do you wait to see the anatomy and then repeat the study with stress, or just send for FFRCT? At the moment, to be honest, we are just using a stress CTP for um, research aim. So uh, uh, our clinical workflow at the moment is uh, considered just CT plus FFRCT, and uh, we are doing just stress CT in a control uh, study just to be sure that is powerful and uh, it is uh, it is uh, robust. In my perspective, I think that. Uh, Probably a potential um, uh, future scenario could be the following one. We have uh, the first step that is a CT that in case it's negative is usually enough to rule out the presence of coronary artery stenosis. In case it's positive and you do FFRCT and this is a negative, that is enough. In case you have a positive FFRCT, you have two different kinds of patient. Patient FFRCT... Is, there is a little bit of noise. In case there is one scenario in which the FFRCT is a clear positive, and so we refer the patient to CAT. And the uh, second setting is a patient in which FFRCT is a mild positive or is not consistent with anatomy. So this is probably a small setting in which we can refer the uh, patient to stress CTP. So I imagine the FFRCT as a potential gatekeeper to decide if we need, really need the stress CTP or if we can skip this phase. Okay, that's helpful. Okay, well, I thank uh, you uh, uh, both uh, for excellent talks uh, and excellent case presentations. And I thank you all for participating and uh, engaging. There's a planned webinar, I believe, after um, uh, the integration of the new uh, reporting software. We'll have a webinar that will be done in uh, late February, which will be something to look forward to, uh, which is going to be done with a number of people, including uh, Dr. Hurwitz, who's on this call. The idea being focusing on how to interpret uh, FFRCT results, which is obviously very important, and the whole discussion around distal to the uh, um, uh, distal to the uh, stenosis for the distal but lowest value. So that'll be something to look forward to. But again, thank you, Gianluca, for taking the time. I know you're away from home, but show, sharing us that excellent case and Bjarne for the tremendous talk and all of you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you, thank you to all for your attention. Yeah. Be well. <laughs>